we have a special bullpen today. We covered this story because it was so important to the culture, to the, inter to the international community, and to our understanding of racism in a global context. Racism for sale. I'm gonna remind you of the segment we did, and I'm gonna bring the person behind this amazing work, and Revelation, of the bullpen. Here it is. Yes, you heard that correctly. The kids are saying, in Chinese, I'm a black monster. My IQ is low. This video was released in February 2020 on a Chinese social media account called, get this, Jokes About Black People Club. Within days, it had more than 4,000 likes and a ton of comments. Some people were laughing. Others were outraged. The word they're using is heigui, which could be translated as black monster or black devil. But really, it's the Chinese equivalent of the N-word. In this one, for example, the producer gets the kids to promise they'll always stay in Africa. In this one, a patriotic song about the glory of China, they're made to sing, yellow skin and dark eyes are the most beautiful. In quite a few of them, we see girls dancing in obviously sexualized ways. Teenagers, and sometimes even younger kids, Sad, isn't it? That's just the tip of the iceberg. The person behind this documentary who exposed this racist dynamic is Runako Selena. She is an investigative journalist and co-founder of Black Liberty China. Ms. Selena, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Let me first say that your work not only is great, but also has had great impact. What was the reason? What was the catalyst for you to do this kind of documentary and expose what you have been able to expose? Well, I mean, I was based in Beijing and that was home for almost seven years. It was my seventh year, actually, as the pandemic started and I returned back to the UK. And throughout that time, obviously, I was kind of preoccupied with the experiences of people of African descent in China and in relation to China as well. Um, those were sometimes firsthand experiences, but they were also communal experiences. And one of the things I realized very early on was that social media played a massive part in the ideas of blackness in a Chinese context. And these videos started around 2015. So that's seven years now that this industry has existed. Initially, these videos started off quite innocently. You know, they started off with children um, holding placards saying happy birthday or kind of go on, like, come on, you can you can win or you can achieve things. Um, slogans that by themselves are not problematic, but of course the idea of going into anyone's village or anyone's community and filming their children is problematic by itself, right? Um, but eventually, just like most things on social media, we start to see that this content gets progressively worse, progressively dramatic and just, you know, eventually we see the type of content that we see in this in this documentary. Um, so I think for me, that's that was the catalyst, you know, living there, seeing this unravel and continue to grow and wondering why on an Internet that is as heavily censored as the Chinese one, this content was allowed to exist for seven years. Yeah. Tell us the scheme, because these individuals, uh, those who are predatory, in my opinion, would literally pay mm -hmm. in order to have access. Explain this scheme to us. So uh, typically these videos are filmed in rural villages. And I think it's really important to state that this individual that we kind of challenge and, um, you know, we expose in the film is not by himself. You know, he's one of the most prolific content creators in this 
history, but there are many. So they find rural villages in countries that are already already kind of economically underprivileged. And they kind of go into these villages, approach the parents of these children and create a dynamic in which people presume locally that this is educational, that this is charitable. But these videos are actually part of a massive industry and business that earns people, you know, thousands. We've seen this in the film. He admitted to us how much he was able to earn. But it's really important to state that local people have no understanding that this is a business, this is profitable, this is not charitable. So it's kind of, it's kind of that power play, you know? Let's yeah. talk about the consumerism, because obviously this is a business as well as racist. But there's a consumer on the other side. Who's consuming this kind of sickness? So I think there's two sides to this, right? Yeah. We often see that in the Chinese audience for this content, people presume, just as those on the ground who are being filmed do, that this is helping people locally because that dynamic is created by the content creators themselves. You know, they play this, we, we see a segment of this in the film. They play this so sad music. Oftentimes they'll play them, they'll show themselves handing items of clothing, food, et cetera, et cetera, to people on camera, normally children um, or people who are considered vulnerable, the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea there is that for the uh, some Chinese consumers who buy this content that actually they're helping local communities ultimately though this is only with the content that is unproblematic so not the content in which we see the children demeaning themselves um but content which is like happy birthday and things like this, this you also happening. have a second oh go ahead I'm sorry go ahead yeah, yeah. So you also have a segment in, um, of customers who are purchasing this type of content because they like to deride, you know, they like to deride black people. And this kind of speaks to the issue of racism, which is a global problem. But, you know, as I said, I, I live there myself, is something that we have to kind of be honest about in a Chinese context also. You know, I spent, and it was very, very hard um, for myself as someone who, you know, relates to these children, just going through the con the comments in um, these videos and seeing what people were saying and that kind of spoke to the, the attitude of some of the consumers also. This may not be yeah. the politically correct way to frame it, uh, but I'm going to say mm. it the way it's in my mind. Explain to us the sentiment of Chinese or racism in China. Explain the differences, nuances we may not know. Well, OK, so we're speaking of a nation which is very homogenous in comparison to those that we may have grown up in in the West. So I think that's important. We're also speaking of a nation that doesn't have the same kind of history of colonization, et cetera, et cetera, as the West does with many people, most people of, across the world of African descent, um, black and brown as well. And so, you know, my kind of approach to racism in China was always to be a bit more open to educating and speaking because that exposure just isn't there. So when people do speak about ignorance uh, as a form of racism, if you like, in the Chinese context, there is that. However, there is also a section of society, just like anywhere, that is more extreme and that kind of finds joy in, in kind of making the experience of being black in China Horrific, you know, there are content creators who are black in China and who try to share their everyday life, their enjoyment of the country online. And if you read some of their comments, you know, you get a very strong idea of what people are saying, what people believe. Some of this is related to this idea, which I kid you not, despite the fact that black people make up 0.00% of, you know, the, um, the, the population, there is this kind of fear of a blackening country, if that makes sense. So the population becoming increasingly black. And that encourages some online to tell black people to leave the country in not so kind terms. So, you know, this is how racism often manifests there. And it's interesting because I grew up in countries that I was often the minority, you know, and, and racism often manifested in a very similar way. But it is a difficult dynamic because you've got to remember China has its own internet spaces. Um, it has its own kind of, you know, it, its own universe in a sense. And so 
it can be, feel very hard for people of African descent within China to feel supported um, when they're faced with things like this. So it's a it's a big issue. And that's not to say everyone within the country feels the same way towards black people. I mean, I stayed there myself for such a long time for a reason. But I don't think we progress at all if we're not honest about these issues. And sometimes I felt a resistance towards an honest tackling of anti-blackness and racism in, in the society. I read some of those comments from the original poster we are uh, we saw in the documentary, and definitely there was a variation um, of uh, opinion. Some were obviously racist. Others were saying, listen, that's yeah. not us. We need to stop this. You need to take this down immediately. Let me ask you about government and corporate response. Has there been a response that's significant from the government of China or major corporations that back these particular platforms? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, that was one of the things that I was really glad to see. You know, we've seen on the Chinese government side and the Chinese embassy in Malawi um, kind of saying this content, we do not condone it, you know, and we don't approve of its existence. Um, so these statements by themselves, obviously, we hope that they lead to real change on the ground. Um, as I said previously, you know, we know of censorship on Chinese social media. And it is interesting to me that in all my years there, this content continues to exist online. So I'm hope, hoping that coming off the back of those statements, we actually see real change, right? Um, I'm still holding my breath to see, you know, it, the film came out in June, um, but we have seen those statements. Also really important to state that on the Malawian side, there has been so much action. Um, this film would not have been possible without Henry Mahanga, who is just an excellent investigative journalist from Malawi um, who also investigated this with me. And on the Malawian government side, we've seen that the man in question, you know, that we allege made this this hideous video has been extradited back to Malawi. And he's currently kind of waiting prosecution to, well, to see what happens. Um, so, you know, I think this shows that on both sides, there is interest in kind of seeing this content rooted out um, again, though, I hope that this leads to more of a conversation because we do say this in the film, but if you blink, you could miss it. And it's this idea that this is one person in one village, in one country, but the issues that, you know, his content represent is much, much broader. So, yeah, the conversation cannot stop here, naturally. What's the protocol for educating uh, individuals or the families uh, who have been exploited or they are vulnerable to get exploited? Is there a protocol for that or plan for that? Well, I think within the context of the film, you know, we kind of sat down and had conversations with, um, I mean, the, the, the one that stands or sits with me the most yeah, to this day is with Bright, who ended up being the face of the industry in many ways. He was four years old when he was performing in these videos um, and obviously naturally had no idea what they were being used for. We sat and we spoke with his mother and, you know, it was very obvious that dynamic that I described earlier of lack of awareness and an exploitation of language barriers and um, and poverty that, that led to them being in that situation. So, you know, I guess as part of the film, as much as it was about accountability, it was also about education and showing the families what is happening. Um, again, it's a bigger issue. There's a scene in the film very early on, um, and it's we show a map of the African continent, and we highlight the location of operations that I sat down and found and geolocated across the continent. And the purpose of that scene was to show that, okay, we've spoken to families in Malawi in two separate villages who appeared in these videos who were exploited financially and otherwise but elsewhere this education needs to happen um luckily BBC Africa I the way that they work is that they work with African TV stations this content is broadcast across the continent and that gives me a lot of hope and happiness um but again it's it's only a start it's a drop in the ocean and I don't think it's a solution that Henry and I alone you know, have the have the answers to when it comes to that education. Yeah, it takes us all. Miss Selena, I know one thing about fighting evil, evil will fight you back. What has the response been, good and bad, since you released the documentary? 
well I think yeah to be honest um I brace myself you know for for a lot I, I think you always do when anything is coming out that is investigative because you always have people on both sides who have things to say um but overwhelmingly you know the response has been great and I think it touched me a lot to see that within China you know as I said half of this is about ignorance you know you go to a country that is not your own and you can create whatever narrative that you want because you know the majority of people in your home country are never going to interact with an African or a black person they're never going to go there so you can exploit that ignorance right and I think for many people on the Chinese side it was a wow this is what is going on on the ground moment um, and I saw that in the reaction for the most part. Of course, you have the troll here or there um, who has something else to say. But overall, I haven't I can't honestly say that I've received um, hate because of the film. I've just seen changed attitudes and kind of this conversation that I always hoped would would start about race. Yeah, you have definitely sparked significant conversation internationally. I hope you continue to do these uh, very revealing documentaries that have great impact. Uh, Runako Selena, investigative journalist, co-founder, Black Liberty China, uh, racism for sale. Uh, how can people get it? How can people see it now? So, I mean, it's on YouTube. Um, you can search for racism for sale. The documentary will come up. It's also available in, I can't keep count of the languages um, and it's dubbed in both Putonghua, Mandarin, and Cantonese. Um, so you can just search for Racism for Sale on YouTube and you'll find it. If you're in the UK, I play it as well. Yeah. My dear sister, thank you for your courageous leadership. We need more leaders like you. I am thankful. All right, we'll have you back because I know another one is coming at some point. We're <laughs> going to be right here again. But thank you so much for all you do. Thank you very much. All right. What an amazing leader who saw a problem and decided to solve it. Exposure, transparency. The greatest way to fight evil is to expose it and be willing to fight it.